Okay, welcome everybody to the second of our um, series in on climate change and philosophical issues. Um, coming up next week, uh, same time, same place, we have Roman Frigg from the London School of Economics, from the other London. And a week after that on the 29th, um, Landon Smith, also from the um, London School of Economics. Uh, I'd like to also like to mention another exciting event that we have coming up next week, next Thursday, October 23rd at 7 p.m. Um, it's gonna be a panel discussion. Um, let me put these first questions back to these issues. Climate change, what is to be done? It's on um, climate policy. Um, four esteemed panelists, one, Gary Brown, um, who's a, a face who's known to many people in the community, and if you don't know his face, here he is right there. <laughs> um, Radislav Dimitrov, he's a professor of political science at Western. He's also been a UN delegate to climate change, international climate change negotiations, so he's gonna talk about um, uh, uh, things at the international level, le level. Heather Douglas, who does philosophy and public policy at the University of Waterloo, and Jeffrey Simpson, columnist from the Globe and Mail, also a name that is known to many of you. Uh, so hope you'll join us for that. Um, again, it is a free to the public. Spencer Engineering Building at Western University, room 1200, find our Facebook page, and There'll be a reception afterwards where you can talk to the panelists and there will be snacks. Okay, so I hope you're good for that. So tonight we have Julian Barker from the Department of Philosophy at the University of Western Ontario. And he's gonna talk about ecological thinking about climate change. And this is Chris Carabell. <laughs> thank you, Wayne. And thank you all for coming. Um, so it's uh, a new paradigm, question mark, right? So the question is, are we, is there, is there a reason to be calling for a new paradigm? Lots of people are actually calling for a new paradigm. So you'll see uh, what I mean by that. The, my plan here is to investigate what they mean when they say that, uh, and then to ask whether they're right or what we can say about the, the, the proposal that's put forward. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. Okay. So this is what I mean by calls for a new paradigm. Here are just a few samples. <clears throat> I don't know how well you can read this. So this is a book called Water for the Recovery of the Climate, A New Water Paradigm. This is an upcoming conference called Biodiversity for a Livable Climate. Here's a remark about it. Harnessing biology represents a new paradigm for climate mitigation that gives us hope. Um, uh, lots of people, including the World Bank, are now promoting something called climate smart agriculture, also often called a new paradigm for thinking about climate, responding to climate change. So that's the sort of thing I have in mind. That's just a few examples. So the word paradigm uh, for philosophers means something rather specific. Um, and, uh, and, the, and these people are aware of that. In fact, quite a lot of them refer to Kuhn explicitly. So this is Thomas Kuhn um, and a very famous book uh, from 1962, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. This is where the word paradigm really kind of got into ordinary English um, in the sense of uh, a whole new way of looking at things, a whole new conceptual scheme, sort of approach to something. So I'm gonna just talk a little bit about what that means so that we have a clearer idea. Different paradigms, according to Kuhn, so, so paradigms are things that happen in science, right? You, so, so there was uh, one paradigm that was the, uh, the uh, uh, the Ptolemaic paradigm um, of how the universe was put together with, that imagined that the Earth was at the center and everything, all the uh, uh, other planets, the planets and stars and, and moon and sun moved around the Earth. And, there was, and then there was a radical change, a revolutionary change to a new paradigm, the, Con the Copernican paradigm, uh, which places the sun at the center of the universe and has the Earth moving around it as a planet. So that's a really big, just a big shift in how you see things. So different paradigms, according to Kuhn, involve more than just different beliefs. First of all, they have basically different concepts. There's some different, really different way of understanding what it is you're looking at. Uh, they involve differing interpretations of the data. They may agree on what the data are and what the facts on the sort of, uh, uh, to be observed are, but they involve quite different pictures of 
how, how we're going to interpret those, what they mean. Um, different paradigms often have quite different standards of evidence. What counts as good evidence? What kinds of observations matter? What kinds of reasoning are good? Um, uh, they quite often involve different tools, like physically different tools, different kinds of equipment, uh, different methods of reasoning or, or doing statistical analysis, um, and different, and actually different skills for the scientists involved. So, so people in, working in different paradigms are, are working really in sort of different intellectual cultures. And, and maybe most importantly, people who work in different paradigms are thought to have to, to, uh, to confront different problems. They understand the world to contain different problems for them to solve, and they, and they are willing to accept rather different kinds of solutions. Okay? So this is just to give you a sense of what we might be saying when we say uh, our understanding of climate change needs a new paradigm. Oh, hang on, let me explain that diagram for those who don't know. So <clears throat> this is a very famous picture, one of the most famous pictures in philosophy. Uh, as you can see, I hope, uh, it's pretty easy to see that as either a duck or a rabbit, right? Uh, you, probably each of you saw it as something first. Probably mo more people saw it as a duck first. Um, but the, and this is supposed to illustrate the way that the very same facts can look quite different depending on how you look at them. And that's what a difference in paradigm is supposed to be like. All right. So, so, so now we're going to talk about what, uh, what these commentators think of as the mainstream climate paradigm. Um, and, and, and I think I should add that none of them think that the, f the, the facts being claimed here are anything other than facts. This is not being questioned. But what they're going to bring in is a different interpretation or a different perspective on some of those facts. So standard kind of picture says <clears throat> uh, climate change is the result of uh, an imbalance between the amount of solar energy coming into the, the atmosphere uh, and the amount going out again. This is caused mostly by a change in the amount of carbon, in, uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is mostly the result of uh, our burning of fossil fuels, our history of burning fossil fuels. And the result of that is a steadily rising percentage of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere matched by a steadily rising average global temperature. Okay, so this is the, gen the generic picture that we're working with. And some things that are noticeable about this picture. It's, it, it attributes the changes that we see around us to vast physical and industrial processes, physical in the sense of physics, right? Um, these are what are responsible for climate change. These processes are global in scale, and they're represented quite abstractly. They're represented mathematically and in terms of this, uh, just this sort of idea, very abstract idea of light coming into the atmosphere and leaving the atmosphere. What matters is quantities, things you can measure, things you can calculate with, measures uh, quantities of light, of heat energy, of carbon dioxide, and, and, and so on. That's the sort of picture. It's quite an abstract and uh, impersonal sort of picture. And you might ask, what about living things? Where do living things fit into this picture? They're the things that we care the most about. Um, and we know that they're deeply involved, entangled in all of the processes of the, uh, of the surface of the Earth, um, and especially in involved in the cycling of carbons right through the, through the biosphere. So where do uh, living things fit, fit into this picture? Where they, f where they tend to appear in discussion, sort of mainstream discussions of climate change is in this kind of image. So these are a bunch of different ways that living things appear. They appear as victims of climate change, as proposed victims of climate change, and occasionally as beneficiaries. So this is a forest that's infested with a beetle that wouldn't have been able to live in that environment before. So those beetles are doing quite well, but the trees are suffering, and we see the other kinds of harm that are, that are uh, in, involved. So living things appear as uh, affected by climate change, but not as involved in the processes of, of either driving or mitigating climate change. There are some big important exceptions to this, of course. One of the exceptions is cattle. The mainstream picture increasingly is talking about the role of cattle as a major source of methane, in particular, uh, 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 another very powerful greenhouse gas. Um, 
and, uh, and of cattle ranching in general is using a lot, also using a lot of um, uh, fossil fuels and so contributing to carbon as well. Um, another big exception is uh, discussion of deforestation, which is, which is, I mean, both these have both been part of the discussion all along. They're becoming a little bit more visible now. Um, and so the, the importance of deforestation, burning of forests, and also just the loss of forest uh, as a, as a uh, contributing to carbon buildup. But these are really the main two exceptions to that picture. And it's still true that if you look up the big sort of informational websites about climate change, what you get up front is a lot of stuff about physics and industry, fossil fuels. And you have to go several pages in before you start getting a whole, really a lot of information about, about life. OK, so the picture that I'm giving here is, is, is oversimplified. It's not intended to be a, a representation of the theory that anybody has. It's kind of the public image or the mainstream conceptual image, conceptual sort of framework, the way that people think about climate change. Um, so of course, it's true that climate scientists and climate activists uh, have recognized all along that, that living systems are involved in lots of important ways in the carbon cycle. This is not a, this is not a secret and, and, and elsewhere in the climate system. But it's, it remains true, as I just was saying, that, that often those, the, these living systems appear uh, in discussions as, as sort of afterthoughts or else as fixed backgrounds that you can kind of not worry about too much while you're focusing on the big issue, which is carbon pollution. Um, so I ask why that is. There's some good reasons for this, right? It's not, this isn't just an oversight. Uh, there, there are reasons of two different kinds. One is that um, uh, that in a lot of ways, um, scientists have climate scientists have come to think that the the the, the ways that carbon moves through m much of the living world. Um, balances out pretty much in the end, and so it doesn't really make much difference. Um, for a while, people were kind of excited by carbons, the possibility of storing carbon, sequestering carbon in forests, but it turns out that carbon moves in and out of forests quite quickly. The, it, 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 uh, it gets stored in, in wood and in, and in foliage, but when the tree dies, those decompose and the carbon is released back to the atmosphere quite quickly. So, so, so forests don't actually store carbon for very, for very, very long term uh, periods. And so, and so you can, you know, up to a, in a certain way, you can kind of ignore them. Um, so that's one kind of reason for, uh, for, for uh, treating living systems this way. The other kind of reason is a, is a different sort that comes, comes about as a result of where climate scientists start. They start with a simple physical model of the, the Earth system uh, and the amount of light energy coming into it and leaving it. And then they try to fill in, and that's already quite difficult, right? Then they try to fill in the details and start to think about um, the ways that the ocean currents move heat around and the ways that air currents move heat around um, and the storage of heat energy in, uh, in different kinds of materials on the surface of the earth um, and, the, and the latent heat in, in water. Um, and, uh, and that's already very complicated. We're only just now starting to get to the point where it's possible to start to also take into account things about living systems, right? So, so partly it's just that we haven't quite got there yet. It's, so, not, so none of this is very mysterious, but it still gives you a certain picture of what's going on and a, a way of thinking that could be criticized, or that could be extended, maybe I should say. OK, so this is the current paradigm. Um, so let's just think about it as so we thought about what a paradigm is. So this gives you certain basic concepts. The concepts are mostly concepts from physics. Interpretations of data that have to do with movements of, uh, of energy in various kinds of ways. Uh, standards of evidence that are this is, of course, what most of the public debate is about, um, about what kind of evidence over what kind of time span is adequate to really understand what's going on or to give to support hypotheses about what's going on. Um, the tools and methods and skills, m m the, the, the overwhelmingly most important tool is uh, the computer, 
the very, very fancy computer that allows you to do simulation models. And the methods and skills involved are the kinds of methods and skills involved in constructing and interpreting um, and fine tuning these very, very elaborate uh, simulation models. The problems and solutions, the kinds of problems that, that people understand themselves to be dealing with mostly are problems about uh, how to um, identify the sources of greenhouse gases, especially carbon dioxide, um, and then how to shut them down if possible. The kinds of solutions that will be accepted are, the, are solutions that fit into that pattern. All right. So let's just think about where humans fit in and where uh, and, and, and what, uh, what the big story that this picture gives us is. The main role of humans in this picture is as fossil fuel users and, of course, people who are going to be harmed by climate change. The action that is seen as being needed is overwhelmingly reducing carbon emissions. That's the main action that appears on the horizon. There's some others that get mentioned a lot, including now reducing the number of cattle that we raise uh, and slowing deforestation if possible. Mitigation and adaptation are treated in this picture as separate problems. The, 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 problem, the, the big problem is how to mitigate climate change, preferably, I mean, the obvious way to do it is reduce or preferably eliminate carbon, carbon dioxide emissions. Adaptation is something that uh, that, that we can do on the side to try to make ourselves, put ourselves in a better position to withstand things like droughts, floods, uh, fires, spreading disease, rising seawater levels, um, and uh, increasingly extreme temperatures. But those seem to be rather di different kinds of tasks. Um, and this, this leaves us with a, what has to be admitted is a, is a, is a pretty dark picture uh, where we have to recognize that that reducing emissions, or even, even, even if we could <coughs> even, <coughs> and it's hard to imagine how, uh, completely eliminate new uh, carbon emissions, carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuels, um, that is not enough to prevent very damaging further climate change go from here on forward a, for a while, simply because of the amount of carbon that our past fossil fuel, fuel use has already put into the atmosphere that hasn't, whose, whose, whose effects we haven't yet caught up with. Okay, so that's the kind of picture that you get. Um, and uh, and, I, and uh, it's easy to conclude from this picture that, um, that, that we are likely to face, we are extremely likely to face um, very difficult decisions about so-called geoengineering. That is ways of technologically intervening in the way that the, the uh, Earth system works. Um, to either to capture carbon and try to store it for long enough to be useful, um, or to much more easily but much more unpredictably uh, uh, modify the transmission of light through the atmosphere to try to keep some of the light out. Um, and this is a diagram that has a bunch of different um, uh, representations of ideas that people have had about how to do those things. So this is, this is where you end up, and it, and, it's, and it seems very likely that we're, uh, we're going to get sort of pushed bit by bit down the road towards uh, serious, some serious geoengineering whose, whose outcome is uh, entirely unpredictable. Um, all right. So, okay, so now back to the place we started, which is these calls for a new paradigm. Here are a few other examples of the kinds of thing I mean. These are books. These are all books that are, came out relatively recently. Uh, they have titles like Restoration Agriculture, The Soil Will Save Us, Grass Soil Hope, Sowing Seeds in the Desert, and Permaculture Principles, How Surrendering, sur <coughs> surrendering to the Laws of Nature Provides Abundant Success. Here's some kind of keywords where you, could, you would find this sort of writing or this sort of thinking. Agroecology, agroforestry, permaculture, restoration agriculture, regenerative agriculture, regenerative grazing, holistic management, carbon farming, and bioretention water management. There's a ton of this stuff out there right now. It's showing up all over the place. In, 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 uh, I'm sure that you've encountered it in, um, in uh, newspapers, magazines, um, TED Talks. Uh, there's a, the... the uh, this, the, 
the growth of this sort of um, way of thinking is, is rapid and enthusiastic. So, so I want to talk a little bit about what the main idea is, the core idea of this approach is. It's this, that living things, ourselves included, uh, but all living things, have effects on their surroundings, on their local environments, including uh, effects on the soil chemistry and structure, atmospheric chemistry, the formation of clouds, um, the, the movement of water through the ground hydrology, um, and heat stocks and flows, the storage of heat and, and flow of heat between different locations in the atmosphere, in the soil, in the water. Uh, that, uh, that living systems are involved in all of those processes and affect them. Um, that this includes humans, importantly. It also includes all the other organisms that we have effects on, noticeably our domestic animals, especially cattle. Um, uh, our crops, which cover a vast proportion of the surface of the land, um, and the wild flora and fauna that we affect, including all the ones that we try to eliminate uh, or that we move around. Um, and, the, and the supposition that these folks start with is that these kinds of effects may be not trivial. They may be substantial and cumulative and, they, and some of them may work at the global scale, may add up to have effects at the global scale. Okay. So, so according to this perspective, uh, it's, it no longer makes sense to say the big effect that humans have had that has changed the world is burning all of that coal and oil and gas and pumping the remains into the atmosphere. That's not the only thing we've done. We've had other massively consequential effects on the, on the globe, uh, including the effects that we've had via our agriculture, um, which is covered, as I just said, there's an unbelievably huge proportion of the land surface of the world. Uh, the ways that we've modified the, 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 the hydrology, the, the way that water moves across the Earth's surface and also through the soil and into the deeper layers of ground. Uh, and also the effects that we've had on animal populations, um, in particular eliminating, completely eliminating large herbivores from cropland uh, and eliminating large predators from almost all the land, um, but in particular from rangeland. Um, so you probably, most of you caught the news last week that it that the wild, the population, that the total population of wild animals of the earth has uh, fallen by a half since the 1970s. Okay, so here's some kinds of examples, uh, some examples of the kinds, just the kinds of changes that uh, they have in mind when they talk about these changes. So one is the effects of agriculture. One of the biggest effects of agriculture is the amount of bare soil that is, that is exposed through, uh, through long periods of the year. Um, uh, as a result of plowing, the use of annual crops, um, the use of crops that expose quite a lot of soil in between the plants, um, and the use of, of bare soil fallow periods where you don't have a, a, a manure crop, a, a, a cover crop in between your main crops. You just let the soil stand. That's, that's, that's a huge change. Was, um, there, there was very little bare exposed soil in the world before we started plowing it up. Uh, second example, oh no, so the comparison of that is with um, the, uh, the historical picture of the same kinds of land, mostly grasslands or what have been changed, switched over to crop production. Um, uh, where you'd have a green cover all year round, um, of, perennial, of, of, of a mixture of perennial and annual plants, but mostly perennials, um, systematically pulling carbon down from the atmosphere and turning it into the black soil that you see. It's black with carbon. Um, and so storing, sequestering carbon in the soil. Uh, when soil is exposed, uh, carbon, is, carbon is actually flowing out of the soil, being oxidized and being picked up by the atmosphere. So this is a reversal of the, of the flow of carbon. Right? It's not just a change in the amount, uh, but that whereas this kind of um, ecosystem is slowly 
collecting carbon from the atmosphere and, built and putting it, storing it in the soil. Uh, the cornfield that you saw before is pumping carbon out into the atmosphere. Not even to mention, obviously, the, uh, the fuel that's used to plow it and the fertilizers that are used and so on. Right. Drainage. Um, this is an example of, uh, so this is from the English fans. I use this because this is, goes to show how long we've been draining. Uh, of course, there are places in the world where the drainage has been practiced for much longer than that, but the fans are fairly old. Uh, so this is a natural, one of the nat few, few remaining fragments of natural fenland in England. Uh, this is what most of the fenland looks like. And so what you can see is the, that uh, saturated land is being drained uh, to be used for farming. Uh, and the water is being sluiced quickly out um, to sea. The same kind of pattern is, <coughs> uh, is uh, widespread, especially in cities. So this is Los Angeles. This is the Los Angeles River just before it goes into the downtown. L looking not too bad. Uh, this is the Los Angeles River as it is in the, in the city. And you can see that there's, ab there's absolutely nowhere there for water to infiltrate the ground, right? The water, once it gets into this trough, it's all going out into the Pacific Ocean. Um, the, uh, see, okay, I'll pause on that. Um, the, uh, I'll come back to talk about the effects of this. It's important. Okay. Uh, before that, we'll talk a little bit about animals. Um, so this is an example of a crop, uh, a, a field of crops that has no animals in it whatsoever. I mean, it has in, a few insects, not very many, a few hungry insects, uh, but really it's, uh, it's an animal desert. Um, this is an example of um, uh, uh, land that is populated by some herbivores, cows, cattle, um, but, but without predators, um, and there's possibly a role that predators could play in helping keep that ecosystem a little bit healthier than it is today. Okay, so what are the effects of these, these changes? These are huge changes to the surface of the earth uh, that we've um, participated in, and how could they be uh, improved? So this is a complicated diagram that you can't, you can't read the details, and it doesn't really matter. But the, what's being compared here is uh, on the one hand, industrial agriculture, the kind of agriculture that we practice almost everywhere, and that's being spread very rapidly through the parts of the world, the remaining parts of the world where it's not dominant. Um, uh, and on the other hand, um, uh, a kind of agriculture that attempts to imitate in many different ways um, some of the functions of natural ecosystems. So it includes agroforestry, that is places where you grow um, uh, crops interspersed with trees to, to try to mimic some of the functions of a forest. Um, silvopastoral systems, so these are places where you grow, you raise livestock, again mixed in with trees to try to mimic some of the functioning of forests. Um, perennial polyculture, so instead of using annual plants, you use perennials that are there all the time, so they keep the soil covered up. They grow deep roots and they can sequester carbon through the, through the, the uh, fungi that are attached to their roots. Um, and so on. And the thing, that, the thing that, uh, that you maybe can see that is important is the, 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 the big pattern of arrows. In the industrial uh, agriculture case, if you look up at the top, all of those black arrows represent uh, sources of CO2, carbon dioxide, flowing from different parts of the, of the Earth system into the atmosphere. Um, so being, so it's, it's, it's coming out of the bare soil, it's coming out of the factory that makes the fertilizer, it's coming out of the tractor, right? All of these are sources, there are many different sources of CO2. Uh, in addition, there, uh, there's methane coming from the cattle uh, and nitrous oxide coming uh, through the soil and from the cattle as well. In this system, some of the, many of those sources are there as well, although they're smaller. But in addition, we have arrows coming down where the same material, carbon dioxide, is also being absorbed by the system in many, many different ways. So the net uh, outcome is quite different. Okay, now, about drainage, that question about drainage. Um, one of the ideas that some of these people have, and it's shocking when you first encounter it, 
uh, is that because of all of the draining that we do, we drain our cities, we drain our houses, right? We drain our cities, uh, we drain our farmland, we drain our roads, we straighten our rivers, uh, we dredge them. Um, so in all of these different ways, we are, the effect that we're having is to move water faster from the land back to the sea. Um, and with less, uh, with less time to hang around on the surface of the earth and have an effect. And so it gets used much less. It gets, it all, it, most of it gets used by us, right? Most of it gets used by us once and then shot out to the sea. Uh, whereas in a natural ecosystem, it gets cycled locally many times um, before it ever gets back into, the, into the, the global water cycle that goes through the ocean. Do you see what I mean? Um, so the effect of that is that the continents are actually drying out. Um, that is, more water is ending up spending most of its time in the ocean uh, than was true before we started all of this drainage. Um, and, uh, and an effect of this is, uh, is the growth of hot, dry patches, um, especially cities. You all know about the heat island effect of urban areas, right? that cities are hotter than the surrounding. Uh, area, and that's partly because they don't have enough vegetation. It's prob partly because they have uh, um, uh, lots of hard reflective surfaces, but a lot of it is because they're dry, because they're, they're full of, of impermeable materials that are shedding water. And this is, so this is an is a infrared photograph of uh, a place where you can see the, how hot the buildings and the plaza in front of the buildings are. This is uh, degrees Celsius, so about 35. Um, and in the background is uh, vegetation, a park, and, and uh, sort of treed hills in the, in the extreme background, 15 degrees cooler, uh, 18 degrees cooler. Um, so that's just to give you a little illustration. This is an aerial infrared photograph um, that similarly shows these hot patches. These are not urban areas. These are, this is exposed farmland. Um, and, and, and mine tail and plows. So these are places that don't have vegetation, don't have enough permanent vegetation, that get hot. Um, and so the idea here is that, uh, that some of the elevated surface temperatures that we experience are, are actually the result uh, of, I mean, they have to do with the accumulation of excess heat from the sun, but, uh, but they also have to do with the distribution of heat. The heat isn't being moved around as efficiently as it used to be, that we're developing these spots that are that, that remain hot and dry, um, and if they if they get big enough, then they actually begin to affect um, the the water cycle in a larger way. They 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 prevent rain, so a big enough hot dry area drives rain away, right? Because it evaporates before it hits the ground, um, and and that's one way that you can get some of the kinds of bad effects that we fear, right? Including uh, Droughts uh, intermittently with floods, where, right, where the, the 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 water cycle has been affected in such a way that it's um, it's running slow, more slowly and 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 in larger volumes than uh, than otherwise. Okay, so that's the, so this question about the movement of water is an important one. Um, it's it's amazingly easy to fix, right? All we have to do is start. Attempting instead of attempting to so working so hard to to sluice water off the land as fast as possible to construct to use the same kinds of techniques to construct structures that will slow it down and cause it to infiltrate into the soil. This is at Gabion. It's a it's a permeable rock dam that allows water to that slows water down and allows it to infiltrate. And so this is the very same site, uh, two years apart, um, as a result of 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 the way that this dam has slowed down water in the rainy season in this desert location, um, all of this vegetation has been able to grow. OK. Uh, the effect of animals um, is huge. So one of the, uh, one of the important effects that you, that you all know something about is, um, is the damage to soil uh, the, and the erosion caused by by grazing animals that are allowed to graze to wander, kind of wander at will. And this is a particularly amazing example. 
This is the Lewis Plateau in China, um, which is very, very uh, uh, fertile soil, but, but dry and very soft and crumbly. Um, and it had become completely uh, degraded and really desertified, bare of, almost bare of vegetation um, in the, by the eight, 1980s. Um, mostly as a result of grazing by goats that would wander around and eat every little shoot and trample the soil. So this is, this is what it looked like uh, at its most degraded point. This is a photograph from, so that's from 1996, I think. This is from 2009. You can see it's the same location. And all that was done uh, was that people built terraces to slow the flow of water down. Um, they planted trees and, and built little catchment areas to, to hold the water for the trees. Um, and they kept the goats away. Um, that was the most crucial part. So, and this kind of regeneration took place over a, an area about the size of Belgium. It's a very large area. Okay. Um, and last uh, is the, the, the sort of contribution to this discussion that's, the, that's um, the most controversial, which is so called holistic management, which is a way of um, managing grazing animals. Um, sometimes there's a version of it called mob grazing that's used in Australia. Um, the idea is that you, you control, you don't let them wander over a large area at will. Instead, you, you keep them really tightly packed together um, and move them around the landscape. So you have them in one, in one spot for a day and then move them to another spot the next day. Keep them moving, kind of in imitation of the way that a herd of wild uh, ungulates, wild grazing animals, would uh, behave if they were under predator pressure, if there were, predator, if there were lions or wolves after them. They, they stay together in a herd instead of spreading out evenly across the landscape. Um, and uh, some people think, some people really believe um, that that allows, that using that practice allows you to resuscitate damaged land in a, in a remarkable way. The science is kind of mixed on this. Um, but I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. But this is something there's a lot of controversy about. Okay, so let's just think for a minute about what the implications are if these new paradigm thinkers are right in the kind of picture that they're, that they're putting forward that I've tried to sort of sketch with those pictures. The, the effect that you get is, is sort of paradoxical in that on the one hand, it turns out that the problem that we face is much larger that even than we thought, and we knew that it was already huge, right? Because, so it's, it's uh, uh, merely, merely um, ceasing to burn fossil fuels, ceasing to pump more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere is not enough, uh, far from being enough. It's not even, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, a, a lot of the problems that we face may be in fact caused by these other big effects that we've had on the Earth. On the other hand, paradoxically, the, uh, it, I think, and it's, a lot of people seem to experience it this way, that this picture makes the problems that we face seem more tractable and, and uh, our situation more hopeful. So, on the, so it's, it's, the problems are bigger because, because uh, stopping carbon emissions, carbon dioxide emissions is not enough. They're more tractable because there are lots of other things that we can do that will make things better. They won't be adequate, right? We still, the, the, the emissions problem is still absolutely vital and has to be tackled. But there are many other things that we can do, that we can do locally, we can do it at different kinds of scales um, that, have, that, will ha that may have powerful local effects on making the, uh, the effects of global warming less uh, destructive. Um, so, so, so that's sort of two sides of this picture. It also tells us that we are not only uh, guilty of having messed things up pretty badly in a lot of ways, not just in the in the in this uh, composition of the atmosphere, but that we even now are actively promoting extending practices that are very, very destructive. Um, so, for example, the. The, uh, the kind of destructive agriculture that we practice in North America is, is, is even now being pushed very aggressively as the way forward, the way to, pro to produce larger yields or more food um, in Africa and other um, parts of the world that it, where it hasn't yet been sort of fully 
uh, launched. OK, so we're still doing that. Uh, if this picture is right, we should stop. Um, another interesting fact, uh, interesting sort of aspect of this picture is that it makes mitigation and adaptation not so separable as they were before. It turns out that what will make uh, some of the things, many of the activities that we can do that will, that will help to mitigate climate change, that is capture more carbon or slow down the release of carbon or, uh, or other greenhouse gases, will also help with, with adaptation. They'll also help to diminish the effects um, that global uh, climate change has at local levels. So these become more all of a piece. And that is a, that is a good thing, because it means that we don't have to struggle so hard to, de to decide, should we try to mitigate, or should we go straight for adaptation? So the kind of picture that you get here is one where what's called for is not geoengineering. It's not adding new pieces to the, to the climate machine to try to, to, try to uh, make it do what we want. But what some people are calling geotherapy, um, or I would be inclined to call it sort of geo-repair. Uh, not, to, not to add new devices, but to try to fix the ones that we've broken uh, or, or heal the ones that we've injured. Okay. So in this, if you think of this, is, this, you know, is it a new paradigm? Well, uh, I'm not quite sure if it quite counts as one, but, but here are some differences from the picture that we started with. We see here that what matters what matters is not just physics and industry. What matters includes living systems in all of their complexity and multi-layeredness um, and their complex interactions with their surroundings. It calls for us to focus uh, on the concrete and the local, as well as paying attention, obviously, to the mathematical, abstract mathematical representations of the whole global system. Uh, but to pay attention to small-scale stuff that's going on right here um, it, it, uh, it, it gives a kind of importance to what I'm going to call qualitative differences. This is kind of a, not maybe a very precise way to put it, but what I mean is that, that it, it matters not just how much water is flowing through the system, but exactly how, where it's going, how, uh, what channels it's going through, how long it takes, how we handle it. Uh, it matters not, not just how much vegetation is there, but what exactly are the kinds, what, which, what species, how diverse is it, how do they interact with each other. Um, not just how much nitrogen uh, we're putting on the soil, but in what form, how is it delivered, right? This fine-grained kind of stuff turns out to matter a lot. Uh, so if it's a new paradigm, I started out by saying, that means there must be new basic concepts new interpretations of data, new standards of evidence, new tools, methods, and skills, new problems and solutions. And I think in a way these are all sort of in play, but in a, in a, in a very incomplete kind of way. Uh, the basic concepts are concepts from ecology, mostly. Um, the interpretations of data, um, you can see that the ways that these people see patterns of just of uh, temperature measurements over the surface of the Earth, for example, it's quite different from what you would think if you start from the global models. The kinds of standards of evidence, I have to say, are quite different, right? These people care a lot about the personal knowledge of people who work on the land. Um, and they're not so impressed by peer-reviewed scientific papers by people who are on another continent just looking at numbers, right? They, they, Right? The, and, and, and this is a real disagreement. Um, the tools and methods and skills involved are quite different. Right? These folks are not using massive supercomputers to run uh, simulation models. They're out there digging in the dirt. Um, uh, what they see as the problems and the solutions are quite different. Right? Their problems are local problems. The solutions are local solutions. Despite the fact that they uh, that n right, none of them disagree that there all, all, are also these global processes going on. <clears throat> so I'm almost done. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about who these folks are, these new paradigm thinkers. Some of them are scientists. There are actually quite a lot of scientists in this, in this gang. But, m but uh, mostly they are practitioners, farmers, ranchers, uh, water engineers, gardeners, um, uh, pr practical people whose experience and knowledge is practical. 
many of their claims are not well substantiated scientifically, and it's easy to see why, right? They're talking about things that are very hard to measure. Um, they're, uh, they're dealing with cases that are, uh, that are very diverse and hard to standardize. The kinds of experiments that would be required to get serious scientific data about these cases would take decades to run. Nobody's running them. And there's a reason, right? It's hard to get funding. It's hard to get people committed to that kind of work. Um, uh, and so inevitably, some controversy results. And it's, it's the, some of the, the, the literature around this is, is really quite interesting, sort of people arguing about these different kinds of knowledge, the knowledge that you get uh, as, a, as, a, as a rancher or a farmer of your own land over a period of decades as you try different things and try to figure out what's going on, and the kind of knowledge that you get as a scientist by running carefully controlled uh, one-factor experiments. Right? These are different, very different kinds of expertise. Um, and, uh, and again and again, you see people tangling about which of those really gives you authority to, to, to make judgment. So what are we to think about all this? Um, one question to ask is, what do we really know from the point of view of somebody who is interested in things from a scientific point of view? Um, uh, I don't discount the sort of personal knowledge of the ranchers and farmers, but I also have to admit that, uh, that it, there's a point of view from which that's just more anecdotes. Nonetheless, what I want to say is pretty clear uh, in the situation as it stands is that we don't know enough, we don't know nearly enough uh, about what the quantities are, what, what, how much carbon can we sequester in the soil, how exactly would we do it, right? But what we know is that, that, uh, that there's enough promise there that we should really be working hard to find out. A lot more resources should be spent on this kind of uh, research. Um, what needs doing? What kinds of practical steps could we take? Um, uh, so, I mean, I sort of want to invite you to think about this with me in the discussion period, but, but here's some in initial thoughts. It's very important to increase the openness of lines of communication between these different kinds of thinkers, between scientists and community members and farmers and ranchers and practitioners, people who, who are working and trying to figure things out in this practical way. Um, open lines of communication in a way that, so that people can hear each other going both ways, right? Um, I would like to see us be much more active in pushing for, for more systematic scientific investigation of these kinds of questions. Um, I would like to see bringing together um, sort of expert practitioners and expert scientists to try to figure out what needs to be measured um, and, and how to do it. Uh, and, it. And it's interesting to think that there's a possibility for a sort of role for a broader um, category of uh, citizen scientists or people making observations of local conditions, observations of local amounts of rainfall, local soil conditions, local uh, temperature, um, and, and whatever else seems important to measure, right? There are lots of things that we could think about. Um, uh, to sort of, to increase the, to widen the conversation right, beyond these two forms of experts to a larger community of people who are involved in all of these processes and also affected by them. That's it. Thank you. Do you want to field your own questions? I can field questions, sure. I think the way the situation is that uh, if we have to get in, engaged in it, you know, like the, the people at the basic level, they have to do a lot more collecting of evidence <laughs> and, and uh, try to analyze it. Because uh, we're dealing with complex uh, chemical reactions, uh, you know, and uh, that tells a lot, you know, what to do with the soil and, and all that, you know, what it can produce and how good it can stay for how long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree completely. So, <laughs> no disagreement there. Yeah. Have there been any estimates, any quantitative estimates of, uh, on model type systems uh, 
with different agriculture, what the effect this would have on CO2 yeah. emissions. Yeah. Is, it, is it a few percent? Is it five percent? Is it 50 percent? It's not 50. It's not 50. It's, not, it's probably not 50. But, uh, but one of the things that's interesting is that the, um, uh, the basic science about um, uh, what happens to carbon once it's captured by plants in, through photosynthesis um, it, uh, is actually advancing very fast. And, uh, and so uh, five years ago, we had quite a different picture of what happened. So five years ago, we thought that m most of the carbon captured by a plant was, remained to be found in the, in the body of the plant, in the cells of the plant through its life. And so that you could easily estimate how much, what's, the, what's the maximum we could get just by, by looking at the dry biomass. It turns out that's not true at all. That, uh, that uh, up to 50% of the, of the carbon that a plant captures and turns into sugar is actually transmitted through the plant into um, the, uh, all of the microbiota that live in the soil, including fungi, <coughs> uh, some of which can, 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 can carry it down actually quite deep in the soil. And so, uh, so what this means is that, the, that although some models have been attempted to answer the question that you have asked, uh, the real answer is we have no idea. But it's actually looking like it may be more hopeful than we thought. Uh, and it may be. So there, there's certainly a cap, right? The, 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 um, uh, there's, there's really no reason to believe that you can continue to build soil endlessly. Otherwise, the whole earth would be miles deep, right? Um, but what, what, what seems clear is that all the places that have lost a lot of topsoil, uh, or many of them at least, uh, uh, represent a, a potential to rebuild that same amount that's been lost. So there's a sort of fixed amount that we could build back up. Well, I'll tell you what, in the, in the Great Plains of North America, the, the topsoil when, when Europeans arrived was 10 feet deep um, and really full of carbon, I mean black, black soil. So, uh, and most, most of it's gone. Um, it's down to two feet in most places. So, uh, uh, so that's a large potential. There's actually quite, there's actually quite a substantial, what, you know, is it, it's, it, it seems to be agreed, and I think that this, you know, <laughs> I think this has to be right, uh, that, it's, uh, that it's not enough to, um, to offset, you know, more production, more, more fossil fuel burning. But it gives quite a different picture of the hopefulness of bringing carbon dioxide levels down actually down once we bring down our emissions far enough. Do you see what I mean? So, so that we don't get stuck in this picture of, well, we've, we're already committed to a, to a huge amount of global warming uh, because there's no, way, there's no, no effective way to get, to get out of the atmosphere once it's there. Actually, there's a great way to do it. Um, so that's, the, that's how I think. Yeah, I mean, it's a much better concept than the, some of the geoengineering concepts that we, I mean, uh, you're going to have a much better handle on that than putting up mirrors in the atmosphere yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yes, yeah. We know quite well how it works, right? We, plants have been around for a long time. Uh, their effects are mostly pretty benign, and, 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 and we could count on them having quite a lot of, 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 of other good effects, effects on, good effects on the water cycle in particular and on, uh, and on local heat distribution. Um, yeah. Glad I should ask a philosopher, philosophical slash worldview question. Do you think we can, we have the ability to mitigate, mitigate and adapt? You've, you've presented the technical side without mitigating and adapting our worldview slash philosophy. I mean, the Western philosophy, the reductionist philosophy, has gotten us into this mess. And there are other ways of seeing the world and working with the world that have been more successful, not as dramatically quick at making changes, but been more successful. I think that's a really good question. And, uh, and, I, and, and maybe that's really what people are talking about when they call this a new paradigm, when they say they're calling for a new paradigm. Um, and you certainly do see it sometimes in the, sort of in that, so that one book title that says about the laws of, you know, sort of living within the laws of nature. Um, and, uh, and a lot of these people have quite a strong uh, kind of ethical 
uh, tenor to their, to their talk. And sometimes it's very explicit. Uh, that's about um, uh, living within, sort of within the patterns of nature of the natural world and, and uh, seeing ourselves as part of that and, uh, and accepting some limitations that go with that. And sort of. So I think that that's part of the, of the picture. What I think is kind of interesting is, uh, like, so the way you pose the question, um, one way to think of, of, of the problem that you pose is that it seems as though in order to make this kind of shift in our practices, we might first have to change our whole attitude. And that seems <clears throat> unlikely. I, I wouldn't say first. But you wouldn't say first, and, and I think you're right, and it's a good thing, too. But one thing that I think is really interesting and noticeable is that uh, is that there are some, there's a sort of subgroup of people involved in this movement, if you want to call it a movement, who, who seem to have gone the other way, where they, they the first they change their practices, especially ranchers, they're the most noticeable to me. Ranchers are, um, uh, uh, are, are not usually uh, sort of people to go on about the, the wonderful interdependences of natural cycles and so on and so forth, right? But they, right, they're, they're in the business of exploiting certain capacities of the land to have certain effects, that, right? But, uh, but there's a sort of category of people who got into re so regenerative grazing practices just to save their ranches uh, because they were so far in debt and it looked like the only thing that could possibly help. But then having done that, they do come to see things differently and to have a sort of different value system and different way of looking at the world. So I think that there is some possibility that Maybe this is too too hopeful, but that uh, that uh, that changing these practices could bring could pull us along into a different way of thinking. Um, that it's necessary, I guess, was the it's necessary part of my question. No, you know, I'm not sure that I do. Uh, so, I mean, uh, um, one of the reasons that I would like to see much more involvement of kind of mainstream science in this area is to, uh, is to, is to uh, develop the equipment that we need to use these ideas just instrumentally. Never mind what you believe about Gaia, right, and the Earth. Uh, but, uh, but, if this, but if these techniques will allow us to survive relatively undamaged, right, <laughs> as a society for the next hundred years, that's, that's, that's good enough. Um, and if our science can tell us how to do that, then that would be fine with me. Um, so I think, I, th I actually think there, there could be a range of kinds of, uh, of kinds of getting on board, um, some of which would be more ethically flavored, and some of which would be more simply pragmatic. Um, so if there's separate issues? I don't think there's separate issues, but I think but I think, but I think there are different ways of going on in the world, right? I mean, it's true of any any big cultural change, right? Big social change, that that there are some idealists and there are some pragmatists, and and they have to work together to make. You still separate. I'm not, I'm not giving you that. Mm -hmm. Oh no, I no no. I mean, most like lots of people are both. I'm, I myself, I'm certain, I'm surely both, right? So I don't mean I don't mean those to be separate categories, uh, but. Uh, but there are some people who are only one, and there's some people who are only the other. I think that's true. Most, I know mostly. Are you aware of any studies being done by uh, the University of Guelph, the Agriculture Department, you know, like uh, to, to help people assist and all that? Yeah, so I, I don't know about their I don't. I don't think that I, I have picked out things from them specifically of their uh, their um, extension sort of uh, work, uh, but there are people there who work on um, sort of the, the 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 idea of ecological resilience and how we can make our farming systems more resilient, and they, they use some of these ideas. So I think there is a there's some expertise in Guelph. In, in relevant kinds of areas, yeah, um, and and absolutely one of the I mean one of the things that I think 
Um, another thing that makes this way of thinking more hopeful is that there are quite different channels. Like, in order to change people's, uh, our consumption of fossil fuels and our production of, of greenhouse gases, uh, we know a lot about what the, the channels of change are, right? We have to change individual people's behavior choices. We have to change uh, oil companies' behavior. We have to change politicians' behavior uh, and choices. Um, we have to change other, sort of people who make decisions about other industries. These are hard. <laughs> These are hard ones. These are all difficult. Um, uh, in the case of agriculture, a great deal of agriculture is done by people who really pretty much do what, what their local extension service advises them to do. If we can change the advice that they get, people's behavior will change. Um, so this is actually a place where a change in our understanding has the potential to sp sort of spread and have substantial effects relatively easily. Um, and also, it's just a completely separate channel from all of the, car the carbon dioxide channels, which is itself just a good thing. So that's, uh, that's also related to this question. Yes. Most of what you've been talking about is actually scientific facts and things that can be objectively described. But don't you think that a lot of this crosses the line? and become something where it's just a matter of opinion, or it's even some sort of a sort of a human fantasy that, oh, we have this, you know, this wonderful nostalgic view of a perfect earth that existed prior to 1950, and we just have to get back there no matter what. That's got nothing to do with science. And I wonder if when you talk about a paradigm, are you not trying to merge these two? I, I don't like that. I, I, want, I want to know how you feel about that. Is this two paradigms, or is this one paradigm, or where should we draw the line? Yeah. Well, I understand what you mean, and I and there is something that I that makes me a little uncomfortable here as well. I don't think I don't think, however, that these folks are moved by the kind of uh, uh, nostalgic vision that you have in mind, because actually the kinds of farming that they're uh, recommending are not particularly nostalgic, right? They're 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 suggesting doing things that we've never done before. They're also suggesting doing some things that we used to do. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but a lot of the practices that they're suggesting have really never been uh, realized. So, so, so it's not just a matter of trying to get back to the good old days. Um, uh, now, the more general question about how much is uh, a set of values and a, and a kind of a story, an idealistic story. How much is that driving uh, the, the, the kind of literature that I'm picking up on? Hard to say. Uh, in a way, I don't really care because what I care about is what, what can be substantiated when we actually look more closely. And I think that there's enough, there's, there's certainly adequate uh, scientific, solid, perfectly sensible scientific evidence by, by non-romantic people um, uh, to say we should be looking a lot more closely at these processes. Um, how people then choose to interpret what they find, I kind of think that's up to them and I, I don't, I'm not gonna tell them how to do it. Um, so I think, uh, is there more than one paradigm? Yeah, look, there are probably a dozen uh, that people are kind of negotiating about and arguing about, and some people are pretty far out in a romantic kind of uh, fantasy, and some people are not at all. Uh, but that's, again, I kind of want to say that's how humans are, uh, and what matters is what we, can, what we can substantiate and how we can do it and how we can figure out how to make some plans together despite the fact that we have different beliefs. It's, it, it has its unsatisfying aspect. I we only have one planet, right? I mean, we only have one planet, so we better sort it out yeah. quickly. Yeah, absolutely right. I recommend, you know, this, I don't know if you've heard about the Giller Prize. It was just awarded Ms. Klein's new book. Uh, yes. 
it's a wonderful, I, it's just won the prize, so I would highly suggest it. It's all about global warming, and not for people who know anything about global warming, but that's uh, what it's about, and uh, that's why she won the prize. Hopefully Mr. Yeah. Harper will be gone real soon. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to just thank you for your effort. I have an appointment I have to get to, and uh, I'd like to leave you with, oh, by your way, as far as Guelph, they're doing a lot of good work on bees, which is, uh, as uh, Mr. Einstein said, if we don't have the birds and the bees, we're done in four years and we're losing both. But uh, I recommend you uh, look into solar energy. It's free every day and very healthy, too. And it's kept our astronauts alive until Bush killed a bunch of them for the last 50 years. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so my question has to do with, uh, you did briefly mention, and I'll another question, these separate channels you were speaking up about, mm -hmm. these new paradigm um, being separate, I guess, still from the uh, carbon dioxide um, issue. I guess my question came from, I, I do find this to be a very compelling idea, this new paradigm, and where does it, or does it eventually come to be reconciled with you know, these larger uh, global warming issues, um, if there is, you know, more than just the practices, if there's that kind of ethics side to it. Um, do you see that then becoming an overlap with the carbon dioxide issue? Can, can we, you know, have this ripple effect where if these practices start to be implemented, it maybe starts to change the thinking about these larger issues that are, you know, more than direct cause of global warming? Yeah, yeah. That is exactly my hope. Uh, but, and so, um, and, and, and almost all of the people, I mean, uh, yeah, I, mean, I think I can say I, all of the people that I've read working in this area, I would say have a similar kind of hope, right? That, um, that, uh, that the kind of understanding that they are, are they feel they have and that they're seeking um, can help us think more clearly in a more general way about our use of resources um, and the effects that, 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 that our choices have. Uh, so yeah, I do think so. Um, does that seem like an answer? Yeah, um, I guess maybe why I was thinking of them as separate and how they would come to themselves is just the systems. Mm -hmm. So any different, I mean, you know, talk about CO2, you start talking about you know, the whole oil industry and you know, that's a little bit bigger than just changing farming practices, and, yeah. but, but how that could... Yeah, yeah so, so it's, it's sort of interesting to think about how, uh, on the, you know, that's an, that's an easy thing to say that you just said, but look, farming, what, what's bigger than that? Right? It's a, a, a tremendous amount of our oil is used to support farming one way or another. Uh, and, uh, and, a, and an enormous amount of, of the land area that there, that there is. Uh, and it's the thing that's, I mean, it's very fundamental culturally. It supplies the foods that we, that we are so inflexible about giving up and so on, right? So, so, uh, so there's a perspective from which our oil consumption is, is, right? There's a lot of oil consumption that has nothing to do with farming. There's a lot of farming that has nothing to do with oil consumption. They're both huge, huge factors. Uh, does it make sense to talk about one as bigger? Probably not exactly, um, uh, but but what we can say is that they interact, and that uh, that that one of the reasons, one of the many, but one of the re important reasons that we are so addicted to oil is we use it to make our food, to grow our food out of the ground. Uh, without it, at the at the, the way we do things now, we would starve. That's not a, so. That's not an option. Uh, so if we can change our agricultural practices in a way that make us, that break our, our agriculture free of oil, that would free us up in a lot of ways, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So standards of evidence. You said a few interesting things in the talk, and we sort of been forwarding with some questions, it seems. Yeah. On one hand, we have this reductive Western scientific viewpoint, which you said is really good at one variable problem, and, you know, your controlled study, great. And on the other hand, we have the uh, dare I say grassroots, uh, holistic people. And, like we look at the Los Plateau and say, well, duh, of course this works. Um, but at the end, you sort of suggested that Western science should be closer and should work on you know defining what the quantities are to be able to ask these holistic questions. I'm wondering if you have an intuition about 
what the sort of methodological concessions are that science has to make, if it has to make any changes in its own standards of evidence to be able to ask these holistic questions, or if it's perfectly capable of asking holistic questions as it is, that's a great and just question. changing the quantities. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, and, and I hadn't put it to myself in this way, but, but here's a thought that I've had repeatedly uh, as I read this literature, uh, is that something that we need to get better at that, that, that we've, we've let fall by the wayside a certain amount, certainly in, uh, in agricultural science and range science, is, is something like natural history. So, so one of the things that, um, uh, one of the kinds of evidence that, uh, that the grassroots people find extremely compelling, and you can see why, is individual cases, a particular farm, um, and, and for people who are ex experienced with the kind of place that it is, they don't have to measure anything. They walk through it and they say, my land, look at this place. I can't believe what I'm seeing. But the scientist wants to measure these things. I, I don't know. So from the scientific point of view, it, it's, it's just an anecdote. And anecdotes are worthless just an anecdote, no matter how big it is, how many decades it's been running, just another anecdote. So I would like to see, I think, I think one of the things, the answer to your question is one of the things that needs to be reinvented is a way that scientists can go to one of these unique places uh, and investigate it very closely without a comparison, without doing controls, but, but compare it to uh, you know, other nearby properties, for example, and just really look uh, intimately at what's going on in that spot um, and try to figure out how much of it is reproducible also. Uh, so that would be a kind of example. N equals one. What's that? N equals one, but a lot of it. Just like yeah. one study. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, I mean, that's what natural history is, right? It's, <laughs> a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a careful uh, uh, unraveling of um, the pe what's going on with one particular case that you look at very closely. Just to add on that, um, in the social sciences, there's a, it's not a new paradigm, but there are a lot of people looking at case studies, mm -hmm. which you know, mm -hmm. but, um, and they're doing it in a very scientific way, mm -hmm. which is um, different to other scientific ways. So. Um, the, you know, science does science <coughs> does have ways of, of doing things differently yeah. without having to give up some of the methodological issues that we kind of like. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good example. Well, fundamentally, you're talking about complex systems, and complex systems we know have emergent properties, and you can't reduct the system in, 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 the, in that context. And, and the holistic, if you want to put, use that term, way of looking at, at agriculture, or forestry, at the interaction of uh, natural systems has, al has always been more the natural history. Yeah. And, and when, because we can't figure it out, fundamentally you start by observing, and you hypothesize based on the observations and you accept that there are emergent properties out of that process. So this isn't any, any different. It requires a bit more humility on the part of the scientists in, in accepting the, the, that it is, these are very complex systems and there are limits to the reductive methodology. And I don't see that there's a big issue here. Yeah. It's, ju it's just the, the arrogance of the scientific community in assuming a paradigm, a cultural paradigm, frankly, it is only a cultural paradigm, um, that it is far too simplistic for the problems at hand. So I think that's true, but what, there, uh, it makes me think of a couple of things to add. And one is that, uh, is, that, is that when you look at what's sort of going wrong in the discussions, in these discussions, it's a, it's, it's a two-way problem. So the, the scientists are quite unwilling to trust the uh, personal knowledge of the practitioners. Practitioners are extremely intolerant of the scientists. 
um, and uh, irritated by scientists' nitpicking demands to measure things. Why do you always have to measure things? When I can go and see, I can just see well, how amazing it is. Right? So, um, and moreover, they, they think, uh, uh, we don't have time for all that nitpicking, controlled experiments, dragging out over decades, when we already know this works. Just do it. Um, so, the, so, so, so the listening and the kind of tolerance and the humility, I think, actually is, is needed on both sides. It's not a one-way street. One of the things that I think is really hopeful and interesting is the rise of a new category of person in this world, which is people who uh, so the, the, most of the er, earlier sort of transmission of information across the divide between these two communities was f through people who had some scientific training very early on uh, and, and then became, grew up to become ranchers or farmers and, uh, and left the sort of scientific method behind. But they still had a lot of language and a lot of concepts and knew a lot. Um, <coughs> and, and, but they sort of became more and more disconnected from a scientific uh, style as they went on. Well, that's, those are important people and they play an important role. But there's another kind of person that's emerging now, which is people who grew up as practitioners and then went and got a, took an advanced degree in science, became scientists. And I think that those people really stand to be helpful because they, speak, they really speak both languages in a, in a way that nobody else does. Um, and they are able to see what's required sort of by both camps. Uh, so that, I, I think that's kind of an interesting and hopeful sort of development. Maybe that's it. Thank you for all these wonderful questions. Thank you.